Welcome to the Robin Hood Archery video channel and welcome to a rare glimpse into the Robin Hood Archery workshop. Today's theme, is it possible to build a DIY carbon shaft cutting jig that's as good as those you can buy on the market? Stick around and we'll find out. I'm going to jump ahead here and say the answer is yes, almost, and plenty good enough for the vast majority of people's usage. I've been using this particular jig, which I'm going to show you in just a moment, for several years. I'm, I must check back when I did my original photograph, so I'll check. It's probably about three years, something like that. Um, and I produce arrows on a professional basis, so I need accurate consistent and quick cuts. So without further ado, let's take a look at what we're looking at today. Oh, by the way, this is not a build along. I'm going to be showing you my jig and just a few pointers how you could make your own. It's not a, a build along or anything like that. OK, so just to clarify that one, for the simple reason that I don't want to rip my own jig to bits just for the sake of the video. So, okay, can we go along on that basis? Fantastic, let's get started. Right, this is going to be quite tricky showing you all this, so uh, please bear with me. First of all, we need a power source, something like the ubiquitous Dremel. Now, I haven't used a Dremel multi-tool here. I've used one of these which I picked up on, uh, I must check back, Amazon or eBay, I think it was Amazon, for around about 20 euros. Again, I'll check that. Uh, and if they're still selling these, I'll actually put the link in the comments section below. But there are, you don't have to get this specific one. There are so many on the market which are almost identical, in fact, actually, to all intents and purposes, identical to this. The mouldings on the case, the specifications, everything. Okay, so that's the first thing we need. And I've gone for the version which has got one of these rat's tails on it, like an extension, flexi extension. Okay, so that's number one that we need. Number two that we need for a cutting jig is to have the disc, the cutting disc, at 90 degrees to where the shaft is going to sit. Okay, very important that one obviously, so that you cut the ends of your shafts nice and square. The next thing we need is a guide rail, again this is the one that your shaft sits along, which will actually be 90 degrees to the cutting disc. Okay. So, number one, a means of powering the disc. Number two, the disc sat at 90 degrees. Two, <laughs> the number three, which is the side rail. Okay, and I'll show you these in a little bit more detail as we go. And the final one we need is at this end, and this is a, a stop block. This is so that you can set your distance and have something for your shaft to actually butt up against so if you're cutting a set of 12 shafts, for instance, they're all going to come out at the identical length. OK, so let's take a look at some of these points in a little bit more detail. Right, folks, I hope you can see this um, a little bit clearer now. You can see I've got the rat's tail, this flexi extension coming from the power source, and it's been attached to a block and I'll talk about the base last and I've attached this um, the end piece of this rat's tail with these rubberized p-clips now I've no idea what size these are and you would need to check what the dimensions of your own rat's tail is so that you can purchase the right ones from the hardware store again this is not a build along these are just pointers to get you going in the right direction for your own project. All right, let's look at the second uh, position. 
So here we can see my guide rail and it's very much the important part of this build that that cutting disc up here and this side rail sit at 90 degrees to each other. Now then, a couple of points on this side rail. I've actually mounted it on slots. Behind this Phillips head screw here is a slot, not just a hole. And I've got the same at the other end here, which is just behind the rat's tail. Okay, now that gives me lateral movement so I can set the depth of cut okay so that the cutting wheel up here is cutting just through the wall of the carbon shaft very important and also it allows me a little bit of fine tuning to make sure that I can get that disc sat at a hundred percent square ie 90 degrees all right, and that you can do that. You can pretty much get it almost there with these when you're fitting these uh, P clips to the base, and then you can fine tune it via those slots on here. And one other thing with regard to this side piece, I mean, you can use any material you like. You can use wood or plastic or what have you, as long as it's robust enough. I've gone for some small aluminium angle it's about uh, what is it about half inch by half inch 12 mil by 12 mil something like that I'm not sure it's just a piece I had knocking around but I found this the easiest to work with as well um, but of course it's a hard surface so you don't want any scratches on your shaft so what I've done I've got some of this fluffy side of the velcro and self adhesive just one at the front one at the back so that when the shaft sits onto there and you turn it it's not going to get scratched okay let's look up there at the stop block okay here you can see the stop block now i've made a right angle up from the base again we'll talk about all the base last and that is so that I can move the block up and down and then clamp it in the right position. All right. Now, when I first made my jig, it wasn't quite as um, refined as this. I just had a, oh, a, a bit of a wood coming up here from the base of the backstop, as it were. And I just used to use a G-clamp on there and clamp it in position actually on that side. Okay, so it doesn't need to be quite as involved as this one is. The main components are that you've got something 90 degrees here to the shaft that it can sit against. Okay, when you're cutting, that's not gonna move about and some way that you can actually clamp it to the base. Theoretically, you could even clamp from there underneath like that doesn't have to be um, very complicated whatsoever this sledge I've actually gone a little bit further I've installed a tape on here which again is slotted both ends so I can adjust it um, I've gone a bit crazy with the construction here and hang on, let me get the camera there we go and you can see this kind of toggle clamp I've got there which makes things a lot easier for me. But then I am doing a lot of arrows on this rig. Okay, so that's the main components other than the wooden construction that I've done underneath. All right, so let's take a look at that next. Okay, folks, let's take a look at the under construction. I'll tell you what I used for this. This is actually an old bedstead, my daughter's bed frame that I've cut up. Right, I've got a quite a robust base on there doesn't really need to be this chunky. Um, the most important thing is obviously the length. Um, most arrows come in 32 inch, so theoretically it doesn't need to be any longer than that. But you could, like myself, have situations where you're cutting down 
longer arrows that you can get arrows that are 34 inch even 36 inch I'm sure possibly even longer for special applications so the base I've actually made uh, it's around about 92 centimeters um, which is approximately three feet okay let's start in reverse order to what we did the uh, components in all right let me take this sledge off let's just show you that a little bit in detail again it doesn't need to be this complicated you can just take this part and and clamp it to the base it doesn't need to be this flash okay it's entirely up to you all right back to the base so what i've done is i've taken another piece of this bedstead and i've screwed it in nice and securely to give me something to clamp my distance sledge onto. Nothing complicated in that whatsoever. Um, you might be able to see here, I've actually screwed the base down onto my workbench as well, just to make it nice and steady and stable. Okay, now I've got enough run on here, on this length, to go from uh, 35 inches, I believe it is, um, possibly even a bit more and it comes down to 24 inches so quite a range of cut I could do there in the worst case scenario if I had a special project I could take this out it's held in with a couple of screws on the back a couple of good screws which come nearly all the way through but I could take that off and either lengthen it or bring it this way if I had a, a particularly special project I was doing but for the most part that's going to cover your needs uh, 35 inch down to about 24. Okay, so next along the base, let's see if we can just zoom in here a little bit. Yes, here we are. So here I've got my first mounting block for the side rail, and then I've got another mounting block which holds the front of the side rail and the head of the rat's tail. Okay, now I've mounted my rat's tail in board. Okay, you see a lot of these designs where it's the other way around and the rat's tail is, is poking out of the back or the front, depending on which way you're looking at it, of the design. I've brought mine in board just because it makes it a little bit more compact. Okay, it's actually all within the length of the base. And this is why I've left this gap. I've not done a continual block to mount the side rail to. I've left a gap underneath, and that's so that the rat tail can slip underneath and away to wherever you want to mount your power unit. You can go up that way if you wanted to, but I've decided to hang mine on the cupboard like that. Okay, so that's why I've got this gap here. That's pretty much it for the base. Fairly, fairly simple. I've no idea what dimension this is, and I've no idea what dimension this is. Width is the same as the base. Um, and I've got a little bit of height on it. Let's have a look what height. I've actually got two and a half centimeters high here. Now, you don't have to have this. If you're just doing bare shafts, it doesn't really need to be that high, but and here's a good tip for you. Let's go back down the other end and have a look at my sled, the distance sled. With this one inch high here, this 25 centi uh, sorry, 25 millimeters, and this kind of distance here, imagine you had an arrow with a knock on, okay, it's gonna sit about there you have enough distance here for most fletching to sit whilst you cut a shaft. I hope that kind of makes sense. I don't think I've got a knock with me. No, I haven't got a knock with me at the moment. But if that had a knock, it's gonna sit about that far away from the backstop. So your fletching's gonna sit about here. You can turn your shaft to your heart's content and the fletching has enough distance around it so that you don't um, disturb anything. Okay, right, next thing, 
Let's see it in operation. Right, one word on safety folks, when you're cutting carbon fibre the dust is nasty stuff. If this gets into your lungs it's not good at all. Have the appropriate mask when you're cutting carbon fibre. Okay, I'll put a, a closer picture up on the screen now and you can see the specification on there. I think this is an old mask so it's a little bit blurred but I think it's FFP3. Um, but do a little bit of research before you do any cutting. Okay, let's cut a shaft and we can show you how this thing works. So, as we can see, it's fast and a clean cut. There's no fraying on there whatsoever. Now, here's another tip for you. Use the right cutting discs. I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking they need a toothed blade. That's not the case at all. If you can make that work, good on you, but I certainly couldn't. I've used these... Um, they're, like, they're a cutting disc, and I've gone for the proper Dremel ones. Um, I'll put a picture up on the screen now so you can get a closer view. Um, it's like a carbide type cutting disc. I believe they're aluminium oxide. But these are carbon, uh, sorry, not carbon fiber reinforced. They're fiberglass reinforced, so they're not going to uh, fly apart or anything like that. But that disc has been on there oh, over a year. So you're going to get good usage out of it. And as I say, I cut a lot of shafts. All right, so that's pretty much it. It's consistent, it's fast, uh, makes a heck of a noise. I do wear um, ear protection as well when I'm doing a lot of shafts. Um, and it's cheap to make. I, I bought the, um, this thing, as I said, for about 20 bucks. Everything else is made from scrap material that I had lying around the workshop. I'm guessing if you have to bought, buy everything, oh, wow, 20 for that, oh, five bucks for the wood and screws and stuff like that, certainly under 30 euros. All right, that, that, that's nothing for something that's gonna last you a long, long time. That's it for today. Again, it's not a build along. If you want some more information, please let me know in the comments and I'll try and answer it that way. But this is just to get you thinking about what is possible for very low cost and something that's gonna be very efficient at the end of the day. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this. I think it's number four of the DIY uh, videos that I've done. Um, please feel free, to, feel free to subscribe to the, to the channel. Um, it does mean a lot. It's not a monetized channel, but I like to see um, what you guys are following and, and what you're liking and all the rest of it, okay, so I can produce some more content. And on that, I must apologize to my subscribers. I don't post often enough, so um, yeah, apologies for that. Uh, I will try and do more videos in the future. Okay, folks, carbon fiber cutting jig for pennies that works almost as good as the real thing. That's me, over and out for another video. Catch you later, guys.